Okay, I clipped out the part of the live where I read the code of silence to everyone. So just know that I maybe responded to some comments because this was from a live. Now just know when I go over to this other screen to be reading, I may not see y'all's comments. I do try to look down at my Chromebook over here, but it's not on the screen when I'm over here reading. So don't get mad. All right, so we got October 13th, 2016. And like I said, you can find this uh, on a Google search. That's how I found it. When I was doing this rah-rah story before. Now, this, is, uh, this photograph comes from 2008. This is some serious corruption, some mob-style shit that was going on in CPD back before the rah-rah case, through the rah-rah case, and after the rah-rah case. Because they're still cleaning it up now. But it says how the Chicago Police Department covered up for gangs of criminal cops. Now, these two names here, Shannon Spaulding, which is referred to as Blondie, and Danny, whatever his last name is. These are the two detectives that are mentioned in Raba's case that have that female confidential informant. She, this is, a lot of this story here is going to be her story as well and how she plays into all of this. Okay? So let's see. Why does it look like it's starting out? Oh, because it's over here. Okay. Part one, Operation Smoke and Mirrors. On May 31st, of uh, the city of Chicago agreed to settle a whistleblower lawsuit brought by two officers who alleged they suffered from retaliation for reporting and investigating criminal activity by fellow officers. The settlement for $2 million was announced moments before the trial was to begin. They're referring to these two detectives over here, or cops. It says, as the trial date approached, the city lawyers had made a motion to exclude the words code of silence from the proceedings. Not only was the motion denied, but the judge ruled that Mayor Emmanuel, um, Emmanuel, Rahm Emanuel could be called to testify about what he knew when he used the term in his speech to the city council last December at the height of the political firestorm provoked by the police shooting of 17-year-old Look of problems at the very heart of the policing profession and said the problem is sometimes referred to as the thin blue line. Other times it's referred to as the code of silence. It is the tendency to ignore, deny, or in some cases cover up the bad actions of colleagues or colleague. The prevailing narrative in the press was that the city settled in order to avoid the possibility that the mayor would be compelled to testify. But the mayor's testimony, had it come to pass, would have been unlikely to provide much illumination. By contrast, that of the plaintiffs, Shannon and Danny, promised to be revelatory in the words of the judge. They have a story to tell that purports to show extraordinary, serious, retaliatory misconduct of officers at nearly all levels of the CPD hierarchy. When this reporter When this reporter uh, first met Shannon was in 2013. She was in despair. She had risked everything to bring to light corruption within the CPD. She said no one believed her. In brief, she said that she and her partner, Danny, had spent over five years working undercover on a joint FBI CPD internal affairs investigation that uncovered mass uncovered a massive criminal enterprise within the department. A gang tactical team led by the sergeant named Ronald Watts operated and protected a protection racket in public housing developments on Chicago's south side. In exchange for a tax, Watts and his team 
shielded drug dealers from interference by law enforcement and targeted their competition. Their operation went far beyond shaking down the occasional drug dealer. They were a major player in the drug trade on the South Side. The investigation had multiple targets beyond Watts. It was focused on members of his team and senior officials suspected of conspiring with him. It was also rumored both on the street and in the department that Watts was involved in the murders of two drug dealers who defied, defiled him, which one of those is the confidential informant's um, boyfriend that Watts orders some gang members to kill. Let's see. Let me answer this real quick. my mods uh so the two detectives or the two cops were on the verge of breaking the case open the investigation was sabotaged by high-ranking officials who outed them as rats other cpd brass ordered officers under their command to retaliate against them for violating the code of silence reprisals were especially harsh against blondie leaving her financially devastated is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and stripped of a job that she loved. When we first spoke three years ago, Spalding's despair arose not from self-doubt. Her conviction about the substance of her story was unshakable, it, but from her awareness of the force arrayed against her, she was oppressed by the knowledge that CPD brass had the power to impose upon the world their own version of reality and in the process portray her as delusional. I call it Operation Smoke and Mirrors, she said at the time. If four bosses in the department say it didn't happen, then it did not happen. While the term code of silence invokes something essential, the coerced silence of police officers who observed but do not report abuse by their fellow officers. It is, in some respects, a misnomer or impunism. The practices to which it refers are less a matter of silence than of tightly orchestrated lying and various means used to maintain narrative control. Today, in the wake of the political upheaval in the Chicago participation by the Laquan McDonald case, CPD has lost control of the narrative. This creates space for Shannon and his voice to finally be heard. In this article, she tells her story. It is based on extensive interviews with her conducted over the last three years. It also draws on the interviews of the, the male part, Danny, and several others who figure in the case and on the record generated in the course of the pretrial discovery. Aided by the notes she kept on a daily basis over the years, Spalding gives a richly detailed account of the code of silence, not as a vague culture among the ranks and file, but as a set of institutional mechanisms central to the operation of the CPD. To be clear, at the outset, the uh, police officials named as the defendants in the whistleblower lawsuit was Chief Juan Rivera, Commander James O'Grady, Chief Nick Ro Rody, Roddy, I don't know, Sergeant Maurice Barnes, Lieutenant Robert Cisnero, Sergeant Thomas Mills, and Commander Joseph Salamine. They all denied the, their allegations. In addition to citing the denials in public record, efforts have been made to contact each of the defendants, as well as the other law enforcement officers who figure into the story. Each either did not respond or could not be located or declined to comment. The Chicago Police Department and the city's Department of Law both said they do not comment on activity invest active investigations or litigations 
the defendant's depositions and affidavits and sworn statements in which they contest the Spalding and Danny version of events are available online version of this piece at the intercept which is this article this uh paper that made this article okay the counter narrative that emerges from the defendant's legal argument is that blondie and danny played at best marginal role in the watts investigation serving as little more than handlers for con confidential informants and that they particularly Blondie were problem officers others did not want to work with. In February of 2015, a press release about the case, the city stated that Superintendent McCarty and the CPD have zero tolerance for retaliation against whistleblowers, but that the city believes the claims of these particular plaintiffs are without merit. According to Blondie, the united front of the defendants against charges of retaliation under the code of silence is the ultimate expression of the code. If she is telling the truth, a group of high-ranking police officials are lying in concert and under oath. So from the start, Blondie's career was braided with that of Ronald Watts. When she joined the department in 1996, he was among the first officers that she met. As a rookie, she was assigned to ride with him as part of her training. Over the years, they remained on a friendly terms. And throughout their career, they worked the same streets in the second district on the south side during an era of turbulent change. While both are naive, native south siders, they grew up on different worlds, in different worlds, on opposite sides of one of the starkest racial boundaries in the city, the bridge over the railroad tracks, and later the Dan Ryan Expressway that separated the neighborhoods of Bridgeport along the stronghold of the daily political dynasty from the heart of the Black South Side. Blonde and Irish, Spalding was raised among the many police officers and firefighters who make their homes in Bridgeport. Watts grew up on the other side of the bridge in the public housing where he joined the department and became and came to the second district in 94. After a stint in the army, he already knew the streets and the players. Roughly two square miles, the second district in Cape, in Cape encompasses the heart of the old black belt, the African American city within the city under segregation which absorbed the wave after wave of migrants from the South. When, then when the end of the legal segregation, like a great swollen river, overflowed its banks and spilled into the South Side neighborhoods, once the mostly de densely populated part of the city, it was by the 1990s riddled with abandoned buildings and vacant lots, and it contained an extraordinary amount of public housing. While some of that housing was built before, World War II as segregated housing for blacks, notably the Ida B. Wells homes, a sprawling row house development was the construct was constructed after the United States Supreme Court struck down racially restrictive convent convents. Yet in it comfort to traditional patterns of segregation. Confronted with the opposition from their white aldermen who didn't want public housing in their wards, CHA in the 50s and 60s had built developments in traditionally black areas of South and West Sides. The most extraordinary manifestation of this segregation was the so-called South State Street Corridor with more than two continuous miles of public housing of high-rises, which was the Robert Taylor Homes and Stateway Gardens, and several smaller mid-rise developments a fewer blocks farther north. By the 90s, the corridor was said to be the single largest concentration of poverty in the nation.
Did I go too far? There we go. That was the word Shannon entered when she, the world she entered when she became, came to the second district as a rookie and was assigned to Ronald Watts. Hold on, I got to grab something. I need my drink. Hold up. She said, it was a culture shock for me. I was in a world that I did not understand. I was lost, so I needed to learn, and he schooled me. As they drove through the streets and alleys of the district, Watts shared his knowledge of gangs and drugs with her because the drug trade takes such distinctive forms in high-rise public housings. Housing police are a breed apart. Watts, in her view, was one of the best. The world they moved through was dominated by two gangs, the Gangster Disciples and the Black Disciples. Between them, they controlled the drug trade in the public housing. Each operated out of particular high-rises, often at the same development, which were identified accordingly as GD and BD buildings. Night and day, an endless parade of customers was served by the young men in the open air lobbies of the high rises. At various locations around the perimeters of the buildings, solidarity, solitary figures would watch for 12 hour shifts doing security. Most were older men and women. Almost all were drug users who supported their habits by doing this work. Like street criers, they sang out the names of the drugs sold in the particular building. Dog Face, Titanic, USDA, and acted as lookouts if the police car approached. They called out a warning. Blue and white, northbound on federal. And the message was relayed from voice to voice into the inner shadows of the drug bazaar. Now off to the side here, y'all can see the little map that it's showing. Oops where all the housings were located that I just read off. It says, um, an unattended byproduct of the design of the high-rise developments. They had been conceived in the architectural idiom of the day as the towers in the park. Was that you could see the police coming from a long way off. As a countermeasure, Gang tactical officers, the jump out boys, often drove up on the buildings at high speeds. Uh, they ran across the grounds and the sidewalks in an effort to grab the young men before they had a chance to flee up the stairs and disappear into apartments or vacant units. There were frequent arrests. Then, as the police drove away, the drug market would reopen for business telling both drug dealers and police officers, police referred to the cat and mouse maneuver of the drug trade as the game. For one side, the object is to intercept. For the other side, it is to evade. In the era before public housing on the south side was demolished, the setting for this contest was direct high-rise housing impoverished families through which wealthy consistently circulated. That don't even make sense. Okay. In order to meet the never-ending demand, new packages of drugs were regularly delivered and stashed in secret locations as, a vac as in vacant units, utility closets, mailboxes, or garage chutes. Garbage chutes, I'm sorry. Money was harvested and hauled away. The younger brother of a major drug dealer once described to me a vacant un unit filled with grocery bags of cash like tobacco curing in a shed. As they drove through the developments, 
Spalding recalled Watts would point things out to her. Look, he would said one day. See how they're rolling the dumpsters out into the fire lane? They're going to start shooting soon. The dumpsters would function as barriers against drive-bys. Similarly, he warned her, be careful running into the lobbies at Stateway Gardens because the young men would strategically place railroad ties delivered to the development for landscaping projects for the cops to trip up on. So Spalding eagerly absorbs Watts' instructions and learned something every day and enjoyed his company. He was a likable person, easy to be around. He sometimes joked with her and called her Susie Homemaker. You can leave your apron at home today, but he always was friendly and respectful. There was one incident during this period, however, that gave her a pause. They were on the south, on the grounds of the State Way Gardens. Watts identified a stolen car and they took off in pursuit. Now, this is her right here. And I guess when she first started or when she got an award, I don't know. So they, he showed her, uh, he pointed out a stolen car and they start following. The driver ditched the car and ran towards one of the buildings. There we go. Okay, this is her and this is Danny, I guess. Okay. Spalding began to run after him and Watts called her back. He really went off on me. It didn't seem to fit the situation. When they searched the car, they found a trap, a hidden compartment full of money. She had no role in inventorying the money, though. Shaken, she tried to understand what had just happened. Watts explained that he was trying to protect her, that he didn't want her running into the high rise alone. She was unpersuaded. There was no doubt in her mind she could have caught the subject before he reached the building. The incident stayed with her and troubled her. It didn't seem right. On balance, though, she came away with high regard for Watts as a good cop who got solid information and good results. And she was impressed by the respect he seemed to command on the streets. Major gang leaders who wouldn't engage with other officers would talk to him. Once she began to get her bearings, Balding found herself powerfully drawn to the world of public housing. I was like Christopher Columbus discovering a new world. I loved going to work. It was so fascinating. She developed an easy rapport with the residents, including gang members and drug dealers. Her nickname on the street inevitably became Blondie. You're only as good as your word. She observed, trust isn't given, it's earned. The boys would say, Blondie was always fair. I never took their money. I never put drugs on them. They were locked up all the time for things that they didn't do. I earned their respect. So they wouldn't tell me, so they would tell me things. She used to say to them, I'll give, I got two rules. Don't lie and don't run. If you do, all bets are off. She laughed. I was running like Keenan back then. I could run 10 miles a day. I had the world's best stairmaster, the CHA high rises. Everyone who has ever helped me in an investigation is an invisible person. They're prostitutes, drug dealers, and homeless and children. The people most cops don't think or don't see, think about it. Who sees more of what's going on? And those are then the homeless and the hookers. When the opportunity arose in 97, Spalding joined the public housing South unit and began to work full time in the public housing developments on the South side. It's hard to invoke how utterly abandoned those communities were at this point in their history. One measure is that in 95, the federal government had seized control of CHA from the city the Department of Housing and Urban Development official ins installed a director of CHA, Joseph, somebody. He had previously run the New York and Los Angeles housing authorities. In recent interviews, he observed that an additional 
In addition to the degree of concentration and abandonment, Chicago's public housing differed from New York's in two critical uh, respects. The tenants' population was much poorer. While the NYPD had continued to do vertical patrols, CPD had no longer had long ago seceded, seceded in any real control of the public housing high rises. Despite the shadow play of enforcement, the developments were de facto vice zones where the sale of drugs was tolerated. Policing largely took the form of containment. The policy was to keep it in this box. Only when crime spilled outside of the box did intervention become necessary. Frustrated by CPD's lack of responsiveness to the needs of the residents, CHA had created its own police force in 89. Spalding and other officers from CPD Public Housing Unit would regularly work and join operations with the CHA police. After several years of federal management, Richard Daly's administration regained control of the CHA in 99 and, planned the, and launched the plan for transformation. Its strategy for replacing concentrations of high-rise public housing with the mixed income communities. That's when they fucked up. The administration's retort saying of inclusion and community renewal and individual advancement. Mayor Daly was fond of saying, with characteristic fervor, we're only rebuilding neighborhoods, we're, re we're not only rebuilding neighborhoods, we're rebuilding souls. But the reality on the ground was land and clearance. The objective was to demolish every public housing high rise in the city and do so as rapidly as possible. By 2000, as the plan began to gather momentum, Chicago's, uh, I don't even know what that word is, Ar archipelago of public housing high rises had taken on the aspect of the vast aramda of ships loaded with boat people just offshore destined to be sunk one by one. They're giving an analogy. Basically, they had too many people that were getting uprooted from their homes and don't know what to do with them. Amongst the first things the city did after regaining control of CHA from the federal government was to disband the 270-member CHA police force and replaced it with CPD officers. This required rapid expansion of the public housing unit. The city had $30 million federal grant for the purpose of ultimately hiring 375 additional officers. Commander Ernie Brown was appointed to head the unit which was comprised of Public Housing South and Public Housing North, both under Brown's command. When Public Housing South expanded, Ronald Watts, now a sergeant, joined the unit as a supervisor. He and Ernie Brown, according to Spalding, were said to be friends. Watts brought with him the core of the tactical team he had worked with in the 2nd District and would work with throughout his career. His partner, Mohammed, along with Alvin Jones, Brian Bolton, and Bobby Gonzalez. The, ex the expanded public housing unit brought together a large number of officers who had never worked together before, as well as some who had. Cops are gossips, observed Spalling, and the unit was a awash in rumors. There was talk about shakedowns of drug dealers, about big players paying off the police for protection. Some of the rumors focused on former CHA officers who made the cut and joined the unit. Others focused on Watts and his team. Spalding gave them little weight. Having worked with Watts, she was inclined to attribute the rumors to professional envy. Knowing what she knows now, she wonders how did she not see the corruption she would later uncover. I truly think it was going on, and to the extent that it was going on, she assumed the bosses were actively investigating. Looking back now, she realizes that she wasn't included in the big bust involving large amounts of drug money. I may have had great numbers, 
but I wasn't with the program. It wasn't hard to shut Spalding out of the action with only a year and a half on the job. She was she landed on the gang tactical team. She was still learning how things were done and she was a woman. So she wasn't involved in searches of male subjects and wasn't in the locker room where she said the real planning and scheming goes on. Mickey, a friend from Bridgeport who joined the department when Spalding did, went to public housing south with her, had a different experience. Soon after coming to the unit, he observed patterns of corruption involving, among others, a former CHA police officer named Joel, who had made the cut to join the CPD. Eventually, Joel, or was that Mickey? made contact with the FBI special agent Ken Samuels to report the corruption he was observing within the public housing unit. Mickey was placed on Watt's team in an affidavit he provided to Balding, I mean, uh, Blondie and Danny, the whistleblowers. He stated that on multiple occasions, the team made large seizures of drugs and money that were never entered into the inventory log. Watts would tell other members of the team that they had they could leave, that he and Mohammed would do the inventories. After one major seizure, Mickey checked the inventory log the following day and found that it was empty, as if there had never been a bust at all. He challenged Watts about this. Watts responded that he was trading up for information that would lead to bigger busts and major assets. Mickey was not persuaded. Are you, what are you accusing me of? Stealing Mickey? Watts yelled at him. Well, fuck you. I will put papers on you and make a case on you. The projects are dangerous. Be careful. You won't make it out alive. Sometime later, Watts told Mickey that his commanding officer, Lieutenant Jimmy, wanted to talk with him. When Mickey informed Lieutenant about the missing inventory, the lieutenant asked him whether he had gone to the Internal Affairs Division. Mickey said that he had not, that it was just a, super, a suspicion. You're accusing my sergeant and fellow officers of stealing, the lieutenant said. Well, I don't believe you, he told Mickey. He should have immediately gone to a supervisor. You know what, lieutenant said? I think you're the corrupt one, and that's why you didn't go to your supervisor. Mickey denied the accusations. The lieutenant became agitated. Pack your fucking bags. You need to get out of this unit. I'm moving you to another team tomorrow. And don't even think about going to IAD now. I can call anyone and make your life miserable. You better keep your mouth shut. You don't want to lose your life over this. If you report a sergeant to IAD, how long do you think you will last? So Mickey was distraught. According to Blondie, he decided to take a leave of absence from the department and went to headquarters to execute the necessary paperwork. When the lieutenant found out of what Mickey had done down at headquarters, he assumed he had gone to internal affairs. They had a fierce exchange, which Blondie overheard. The lieutenant, said, lieutenant she said, had lost his mind. Before Mickey went to the FBI, Blondie had tried to dissuade him. She thought he was overreacting, but to no avail. Some months later, she was contacted by Special Agent Ken Samuels. They spoke on the phone several times. The main topic of conversation was Joe. Samuels also mentioned in passing several other officers, Watts being among them. She told him that she hadn't witnessed any criminal activity within the unit because I just didn't see it then. What'd she say? Let's see. You was over there, Shadow? She said, neither did I at first. During those first those years, I was a daily presence in the South State Street. I had several roles. I was advisor to Stateway Gardens Resident Council. I 
developed a program of grassroots public works designed to create alternatives for gang members. Full disclosure, I was the source of the rebel ties for landscaping projects repurposed by the drug dealers that Watts warned Spalding about. So this is another person talking now. As a writer, I documented conditions on the ground. It took several years of immersion for me to begin to see the way the police were present and then absent at Stateway. The residents educated me, coming and going to and from their homes. They consistently navigated the open air drug marketplace up under the buildings. Day after day, they saw the same dealers in the same positions conducting their business. They didn't have the moral luxury of demonetizing them, for they knew many of them in the other roles besides gangbangers, a son, a nephew, a boyfriend, a teammate, a neighbor, a friend. Francine Washington, president of the Stateway Resident Council, used to invoke this knowledge by speaking of our in-laws and our outlaws. The nature of the law enforcement in Stateway was mystifying. The police more often seemed a disruptive presence than a source of order. They didn't control, they didn't patrol the development in a conventional sense, nor did they respond with any consistency to the calls for service from residents. They mostly interacted with those in and around the drug market. They would hit the buildings, make arrests, and yet somehow nothing ever changed. The picture was further com complicated by conscientious, hardworking officers once encountered who were civil towards residents and seemed to be trying, however ambitious, their assignments to do their jobs. It was puzzling why they were not more effective. In every available forum, residents ask, why can't the police shut down the drug traffic? trade down. Why can't this community have the same sort of law enforcement other neighborhoods have? Are the bored young men loitering in the lobbies such master criminals? Is this the security system of drug addicts shouting out warnings so effective the police are unable to penetrate it? An African-American officer in the public housing South unit once turned the question around and put it to me this way. Think of the police as the working poor. Create a situation in which there's a lot of money and drugs on the street in the neighborhoods no one gives a fuck about. What do you think is going to happen? That's Ida B. Wells in 2007. From my perspective on the ground, the larger forms of alleged corruption, the shakedowns, the protection rackets, the drugs and the money seized but were never inventoried, were not visible. What was apparent were daily street-level abuses. Excessive force was more than normal than the exception. For some officers, it was a sport. They would grade one another on the blows they inflicted. The language of ra racial invective um, and then it's got all these slurs, was routine on occasion over the loudspeakers of the police vehicles. There were officers who found it amusing to toy with those under their power, arranging a foot race of heroin addicts to determine who would go to jail, for example, or forcing a woman they had searched on the street to walk home naked from the waist down. And then there was the corruption. Residents used to joke about the lobbies as a policeman's ATM machine. Short on cash, officers could pop in, take money, drugs, or guns off the young men and go about their way. Some of the most revealing stories I've heard allege that the police preyed on not only a drug dealer, but also on some of the most vulnerable members of the community. While the public housing unit was 
staffing up, the special operations section was deployed to South State Street. An elite unit that wasn't tried to districts, SOS would later employ during a scandal involving shakedowns of drug dealers, robberies, and kidnappings. It was disbanded in 2007. But in 1999, an inter I interviewed a group of older women after a SOS team did a sweep of their building. They reported money and value household objects missing. They didn't just steal big money, said one woman. They stole the little money. Similarly, residents told of certain officers who could be counted on to show up at the development on the 1st and the 15th of the month on their check day to take money out of the pockets of the residents after they received the currency exchange. During more than a decade of immersion in public housing, I was never in a position to observe police extort payoffs from the drug dealers in exchange for protection. Yet I frequently witnessed or heard about police conducting that conduct that made manifest just how much space there was for abuse. A place where police officers can steal grocery money from the poorest of the poor and indulge in casual cruelty without the fear of consequences is a place where anything is possible. I told y'all it's crazy. The corruption was crazy, crazy. It says in 2001, the public housing South Unit was hit by a major scandal. Two of the members of its members, Sergeant William Patterson and Op Officer Daryl Smith, were caught in an FBI sting, ripping off what they believed to be drug stash, a drug stash house. Their MO was to come in on their days off and generate phony search warrants. They would then hit a drug house, present the bogus warrant, and take everything they could lay their hands on. Having brought into the roost, their victims would anxiously await the filing of the charges that would never come. The arrest of Patterson and Smith served to fortify Spalding's trust in the institution rather than undermining it. She saw it as proof that the, if officers engaged in serious misconduct, they would be disciplined. She also read it as a confirmation that the FBI investigation of the lieutenant and Watts was yielding nothing. So in 2004, when the public housing South unit was abruptly disbanded, police officials explained that because a number of the CHA high rise had been demolished by that time, a specialized unit was no longer necessary. The public housing that remained would be policed by the district's and the new roaming targeted response team. Blondie went to the first district where she became partners with Danny. He and her had known each other and other in passing before they had became partners. Riding together, they became close, known to the street as Blondie and Danny Boy. They worked well together and enjoyed each other's company. Today, their mutual affection and loyalty are evident. They have been through a lot together, like combat veterans or a long married couple. Each knows things about the other no one else does. And they have a maze narrative of wealth to which they hold joint title. Listening to them recount the amid crossfire banter, their adventures and misadventures in public housing, it's clear they love their jobs. The first district was just north of the second district that included the Harold Ikey's homes, a mid-rise public housing development that was one of the last to be emptied of the residents and demolished. As other public housing communities were raised, its open-air drug markets became more and more active and congested. Spalding and Danny attributed a large part of their effectiveness in working the Eichels to the quality of their confidential informants, particularly a homeless man who drug dealers sometimes used as a courier. 
he would ferry drugs and cash from place to place in a funky knapsack no one was disposed to search. They speak of him almost as a third partner. Spalding christened him Chewbacca. That's the one I was talking about earlier. She observed him jumping out of a dumpster in which he had been forging, looking crazy with long Antarctic hair and mouth containing braces, but with very few teeth. Somebody, Danny observed of the braces, must have loved him. Chewbacca didn't want to be formally registered as a confidential informant with the city. He worked with Blondie and Danny on the strength of their professional relationship. Chewbacca trusted us, said Blondie. Their relationship was one of receptivity. They helped him out with his needs. Gave, he gave them information. They didn't pay him in the conventional sense. Rather, they cared for him, providing him with food and clothing, a sleeping bag, blankets, soap, towels, to shower at the park district, mouthwash and toilet paper, a bus pass, and so on. Chewbacca calls Danny by his street name, Danny Boy, but has his own name for Spalding. I'm not going to call you Blondie like the rest of them, he told her early in their relationship. I'm going to call you Smarty because you're the brains of the operation. After intelligence that Blondie and Danny gathered at the Ikes provided the basis for a major drug bust, their pat on the back as Danny put it, was to be assigned to the narcotics division within the organization, organized crime bureau. Blondie worked undercover making buys because she was known on the streets of the South Side. She worked the West Side. Danny did enforcement, surveillance, intelligence, gathering, and debriefing of those arrested. Working out of, the, of a satellite office maintained by the organize, organized crime bureau in the second district, which he shared with his immediate superior, Sergeant Roger Watson. The point of the operations is to work up the food chain. If those at low level cooperated and provided good information, prosecutors may agree to reduce their charges. Watts had returned to the second district after the public housing south was disbanded. That's in 2007. That's a pretty blue sky. As his office was just down the hall from the organized crime office, according to Danny, Watts was on friendly terms with Watson. He would regularly stick his head out of the office and inquire uh, casually about what they were working on. Prior to landing in the second district, Danny hadn't known Watts personally, but he was aware of the rumors and had heard his name on the street. Drug dealers he nabbed in public housing would say things like, can we buy you lunch or can we bond out here? Danny was initially confused. Shut up. They're not the, shut up. They're not the crew. He recalled one, recalled one of the young men saying, they ain't like Watts. As he did his debriefings, Danny heard some more and more references to Watts. He was particularly this was particularly true of those arrested in the Ida B. Wells development. They would say things like, why are you messing with us when your man Watts is out there running the, his game? Initially, Danny told me he didn't give much credence to the statements. Guys facing time can be inventive, he said. And they weren't providing him with much of in the way of specifics. It was after he encountered Bernard Brown a drug dealer whose picture was posted in the office as one of the top targets in the district that he began to take the stories about Watts more seriously. I'm checking y'all's comments real quick. Y'all so right about that. All right, let's see. Seriously, seriously. Blah, 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 blah. Where was I? Several members of Brown's crew had been arrested. Danny had been debriefing them when he caught sight of Brown on the street and he picked him up. He had this afro with two ponytails. He looked like a big black Mickey Mouse. 
Brown was sharp. He immediately recognized Danny and Blondie were not officers from the 2nd District because they had different radios. You're the indictment police, aren't you? Brown said, looking for some leverage to cut a deal for himself. Do you guys know Watts? And Danny says, that name rings out. What can you tell me? Brown says, he's a motherfucker that can, that be running the dope in the projects. Are you sure you're the indictment police? Instead of fucking with us, that's who you should go indict. Brown provided enough concrete information that Danny could verify some of what he said with arrest reports and other police documents. He described a criminal enterprise in which Watts and several members of his team were systematically extorting money from the dealers and the public housing. The payoffs were known on the streets as the Watts tax. If a dealer paid the tax, his operation was protected from police interference. Watts, according to Brown, was protecting dealers allied with him while targeting the competition and redirecting seized drugs to his own dope lines. For me, Danny recalled, it was like a big, he, it was like Bigfoot. I've always heard about the guy, but is he real? Then I go to the second district and there's Bigfoot standing in front of me. So I'm thinking maybe there's something so what I, to what I've been hearing. Among the things he was hearing were rumors that Watts had been involved in the murder of Wilbur Moore, a.k.a. Big Shorty, a drug dealer who operated out of the Ida B. Wells development. In, on January the 19th of 2006, Moore had been shot down outside of a barber shop off of 43rd and Cottage Grove. For Danny, pieces of the puzzle were beginning to come together. A turning point came when they brought in another player who started talking about Watts. You're going to lock me up for the four ba bags when your guy Watts is moving dope. They run this shit. This guy put it together for me, Danny recalled. The suspect who described an operation in which Watts was extorting money from the drug dealers and running his own dope lines. This was no pizza fun said Danny, for a particular drug line sold at multiple sites, according to the arrestee, Watts tax could be as high as 50000 a week. He also told essentially that the same story about the fate of Big Shorty that Danny was hearing from other sources. In the course of the interrogation, Danny threw out various different names, including some phony ones, and then asked him about Big Shorty. Why are you asking me about a dead man? What can you tell me? Do you want the street version or the paper version? The street version is you all did it. Watts did it. The paper version is a beef inside the GDs. Danny was impressed. You hear a lot of stuff, he recalled. Guys just lying to live, not this guy. He confronted a dilemma. How could he report what he was hearing about having the code of silence enforced against him for ratting on an, another officer? If I put pen to paper on this, my career will be over, not Watts. He recalled Blondie, or he called Blondie, what the fuck do I do with this, he asked. She said, go to a supervisor and just make him do his job. Big mistake. The plan was to create a situation in which the supervisor would have to file a report. Procedure would be followed. The allegations would be reported, but it wouldn't come back to Danny. He requested that Sergeant Watts come to the room where the suspect was being held. He used... A pretext, he's asking for a white shirt, he told Watson. He's got something to say. Watson entered the room and went to the undo the man's handcuffs. While his back was turned, Danny made a hand gesture to prompt him to talk about Watts. The, 
the man launched into a ripped about Watts, reiterating to Watson what he had told Danny. We're not trying to hear that shit, said Watson. Afterwards, Danny asked Watts, Watson, hey, Sarge, how do you know, want me to handle that information that he gave us in the report? Make that shit a negative, said Watson. Danny entertained the possibility that Watson would follow procedure and open a confidential complaint against a confidential complaint register or CR. Had he done so, Danny would have been contacted by the investigators, but the call never came. One day while he was typing up a report, Danny recalled he heard the name Watts and turned into a conversation where several detectives were having about Watts' possible involvement in the killing of Big Shorty. He was struck by the tenure of the conversation. The detectives seemed resigned that the department would not pursue the matter. Blondie had also heard details about the Big Shorty homicide from CPD officers detailed to work the Drug Enforcement Administration, whom, with whom she occasionally exchanged information on an informal basis. The officers told her that the DEA had Big Shorty on a homicide charge. He had offered up Watts and was in the process of proffering when he was killed. A 2005 report on the interview with Wilbur Moore conducted by the DEA and CPD. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, which recently became public in the case of a man who claimed to have been framed by Watts, and his team established that Moore was cooperating with the federal law enforcement and was providing information about Watts. Blondie didn't know whether the stories about Watts were true. I didn't want them to be, but she was losing her confidence that serious allegations of misconduct were being investigated by the department. I'm getting more and more confused, Blondie recalled feeling at the time. How could these high officials not be doing their jobs? Did I take a different oath? Blondie and Danny didn't have def definitive proof that Watts and members of his team had committed crimes. They were convinced there were sufficient evidence to warrant an investigation, and they felt obliged to do something. They decided to go to the FBI. Once they provided their information, they assumed that that would be the end of their involvement. Contacting the FBI, however, would prove to be less an end than a beginning. It would alter the trajectory of their lives and set in motion the sequence of events now moving in an extraordinarily toward a full public reckoning in the Chicago, in Chicago with the nature of the consequences of the code of silence within CPD. Checking y'all's comments. Let me come over there real quick so I can see them better. See if what's working now, Larry. All the time. Larry, I don't know what you're talking about to see if what's working because I didn't know nothing, something was not working. All right, going back to the paperwork. Part two, Operation Brass Tax. This is a picture, just so y'all know, of Chewbacca. The backside. It says, in the spring of 2007, converging on the police scandals in Chicago threatened to engulf the daily administration. Against the background of the long-running John Burge torture saga, stories of police criminality dominated the media. A major scandal involving the department's special operations section had erupted. The charges included not only robbing the drug dealers, 
but also stealing money from ordinary citizens and attempt murder for hire and attempt murder for hire. This was a particular embarrassment to Mayor Daly, for SOS had been strongly identified with his campaign against, as he often put it, gangs, guns, and drugs. The SOS scandal was a textbook example of systematic police abuse in several respects. It was a group of phenomenon, not a matter of individual actors. The setting was the war on drugs, and the victims in this instant, mostly Hispanics, often undocumented, were relatively marginalized and voiceless. Yet it was not the SOS case, but a less typical incident that, ex that excited the most public attention. The feed. My signal is strong, so that means it's your signal. Try refreshing your page if that happens. Sometimes that works. February 19, 2007, Anthony Abate, an off-duty officer, had been drinking heavily at a tavern on the north side, northwest side, excuse me, when the bartender, Carolina, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Refused to serve him any more alcohol, he, be, he came behind the bar and punched and kicked her. Other customers intervened, and Anthony left. Carolina called 911. She told the officers who responded that she had been attacked by a police officer, and the incident had been recorded by the bar's security camera. Neither of these statements had included it was included in the police report, and in the days that followed, other officers put pressure on Carolina and the bar owners not to file charges. When it became apparent that Chicago Police Department was not going to take meaningful action against Anthony, Carolina's attorney released the video recorded by the bar security camera. The footage of the lumbering Anthony flailing away at the petite bartender, went viral. Felony charges quickly followed, and he was found guilty. Superintendent Philip Klein was forced to retire. He didn't help himself when he said, in an effort to convey the depths of his disapproval of Anthony, if I could hit him with a baseball bat, I would. Mayor Daly began the search for a new superintendent and an antidote to growing public concerns that the police department was out of control. Imagine that. That was the moment in the spring of 2007 that Chicago police officer Shannon and Danny went to the FBI to pass on evidence of a scandal more extensive and damaging than those dominating the headlines a CPD sergeant named Ronald Watts was running an elaborated criminal enterprise within the department, extorting a tax from drug dealers and targeting their rivals. Blondie and Danny went on their day off. That's Stateway Gardens in 2007. And took precautions to ensure that nobody would see them entering the building. They were acutely aware that it was a, card, a cardinal sin to go outside of the department to another agency because, as Blondie put it, that means the bosses can't control the cover-up. They were hoping to meet with Ken Samuels, the FBI agent who had contacting Blondie years earlier at the suggestion of Lieutenant Mickey, an officer who had previously been on Watts' team. But Samuels was not available. Instead, they met with a special agent, Patrick Smith. Y'all rolled snake eyes. Contrary to their expectations that they would have no further involvement with the FBI once they passed on their information, Blondie and Danny found themselves in a regular contact with 
Smith. He called frequently, and they occasionally met with him after work or on their days off. During this period, Mayor Daly made two concurrent moves in response to the demands for police reform. First, he appointed Jody Wise superintendent. Not only was Wise an outsider to the department, he had been a high-ranking official within the FBI, prompting speculation that his appointment was designed to help off federal intervention. Second, CPD Office of Professional Standards, which had long been criticized for failing to vigorously investigate citizens' complaints, was rebranded the Independent Police Review Authority. So COPA wasn't around yet, I guess. And Daly installed a well regard police monitor from Los Angeles to run it. Whatever else might be said about these moves, they served to deflate the public's debate about police accountability. The attention of the press soon moved elsewhere. You're also, you must be lagging if you're just now writing that comment, too. Um, whatever else, uh, blah, 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 blah. as Wise was entering into what would prove a difficult tenure as superintendent, Blondie and Danny were becoming increasingly uneasy about their interactions with the FBI. Smith had began to ask them to break away to do work for him on the clock, which they refused to do. After more than a year of intermediate contact with Smith, they felt the need to make sure that they were working within the department guidelines. So in August of 2008, they met with uh, Tina, the chief of CPD's Internal Affairs Division. Also President Smith, Sergeant Tom Chester of the Confidential Section of Internal Affairs, who served as a liaison to the FBI, and Lieutenant Barbara, commanding officer within Internal Affairs. Blondie was gratified by Tina's response. She was so wonderful. This is an important investigation, Blondie recalled her telling them. It's been on our radar for a long time, but we haven't been able to accomplish anything. You two have the means to get results. Tina told Blondie and Danny they would be detailed to the FBI to work undercover on the investigation of Watts and his team. Blondie expressed concerns about the possible damage to their careers were their identities revealed. Tina assured them that their identities would remain confidential. You will be protected, she said. Tina emphasized the need for secrecy. Don't tell anybody. This goes higher than the blue shirts. They have access to your files, your home information. You're working with people who are criminals with badges. In her deposition in Blondie and Danny's lawsuit, Tina confirms that this meeting took place, but her account is considerably less detailed as she repeatedly recalls to the questions by saying that she does not recall. So in other words, she crawfished on their ass. According to Blondie, the formal mechanism for assigning them to the FBI was to transfer them from the organized crime unit, a crime bureau, to the unit 543 de detached services, a miscellaneous detail that would provide cover for their work on the Watts investigation. They were to report to Tom Chester. Only a handful of people within the department were to know of their assignments. Among them was Deborah Kirby, general counselor for the superintendent. Tina would report directly to Superintendent Wise on the progress of the investigation. The joint FBI IAD investigation was christened Operation ba Brass Tax. When Blondie and Danny were transferred to the 543, 
and began reporting to the FBI, no explanation was given to the Organized Crime Bureau. Officers are often detailed to narcotic task forces at the FBI, Blondie explained. So if someone asked what they were working on, this was a su sufficient response. Soon after they came to the FBI, Blondie ran into Ken Samuels, the agent who had called her years earlier to inquire about Watts. She asked him what had become of the case he had was working on them and was surprised to learn it was still open. She and Samuels expressed frustration. This case never went anywhere, he said. Whenever it started to go somewhere, it was like Watts was getting a heads up. We haven't been able to get inside. From the start, Blondie and Danny encountered a good deal of inter interagency distrust. On the first day they reported to the FBI, Blondie recalled Special Agent Julie Anderson expressed surprise that Watts had become a sergeant. They promoted him, she said. What the fuck is wrong with CPD? Anderson would also open, openly suspicious of internal affairs. Your department will sabotage this investigation, she remarked. As soon as it gets to the white shirts, they will shut it down. For their part, the two street smart narcotics cops quickly grew skeptical about the FBI's way of doing things. Among the first tasks they undertook was re transcribing dozens of CDs of wiretaps in the Watts case, having found transcripts marked not pertinent that contained highly relevant material. In one instance, Lou, for lieutenant, was mistaken for a first name. I've ran into that with YouTube videos where it'll say UNK, which means unknown. And I've heard Channels, when they're reading the paperwork, will say, his name was Unk. That was his name, Unk. And I'm like, are you serious? Crazy. In another, Obama was mistaken for the President of the United States. When, in fact, it was a reference to the dope line in the Ida B. Wells homes operated by a drug dealer named Kamein insane fears. Now, let me stop right there and tell you. Going back to Rara's case. Remember the confidential informant, the female whose boyfriend gets killed? This guy, Kumain, I might get it mixed up because it's Kumain and Jermaine. One of them is her boyfriend and one of them is the brother of the dead guy. I'll put it like that. I can't remember which is which. So anyway, his crew wore Obama t-shirts saying, yes, we can, as a form of marketing rather than an expression of political alliance. When challenged by the police, what's with the shirts, they would respond that they were supporting the black presidential candidate from the south side of Chicago. On December the 12th of 2008, a few months after Blondie and Danny were formally reassigned to the FBI, Fears was shot down at 37th and Calumet. Okay, so that's her boyfriend then. The shooter or shooters pumped 17 rounds into his body. As in the case of Big Shorty, word on the streets was that the murder was the work of Watts. Do, do, do. Blondie and Danny expected to be at the FBI for six months, but the investigation moved painfully slow. Sometimes this was due to circumstances beyond their control. In one instance, Watts had an incident, an accident and went on medical leave, but mostly the slow pace of the investigation was dictated by the FBI. For example, Bernard Brown, then in prison, had been prepared to give a statement for more than a year before Smith told them to bring him in. 
When Smith finally interviewed him in August, on August the 7th of 2009, Brown described in detail the structure of Watts' extortion operation. Smith showed him a photo array. He recognized several officers in Watts' crew, including one whom he said once proposed giving someone a pass on 60 bags of dope in exchange for an AK-47. While the FBI had resources not readily available to CPD, high-tech surveillance tools, funds to pay for informants, and use as bait in stings, Operation ba Brass Tax was built accordingly to Spalding on the foundation of the street informants she and Danny had developed over the years. Before they were detailed to the FBI, while they were in the narcotics division, they had gone looking for Chewbacca to see what he knew about Watts and his team. Although they had worked with him for years, they had never had occasion to talk to him about Watts. They had always been focused on whatever particular case they were developing at the time. Now, they couldn't find Chewbacca at any of his usual haunts. It turned out he was in prison. He later told them that Watts had put a case on him at one of the Wells buildings. Watts had approached him and pressed him for information about where some drugs were stashed. In the past, Chewbacca had cooperated with Watts, but this time he simply did not know where the drugs were. So when he wasn't forthcoming, Watts put someone else's package on him, knowing he wouldn't be believed over Watts. He pled guilty. Chewbacca was often in and out of jail on re relatively lightweight charges, such as drinking in public, but the drug conviction resulted in a two-year sentence. It's all right, I could do two years, he could do two years, it's cool. After they began working with the FBI, Blondie and Danny finally spotted Chewbacca looking for food in a dumpster outside the White Castle at 35th and King. He had been recently, he had recently been released. He climbed into the back seat of the car. After they exchanged the greetings, Chewbacca filled them in on his incarceration. They asked, what's all this shit we've been hearing about Watts? Chewbacca started talking, and it was a long time before he stopped. He was an avalanche of information, confirming the scope and the protection racket Watts was running. They asked him how many times had he seen Watts paid off by drug dealers. Hundreds of times, Chewbacca replied. For years, the boys called him Thirsty Bird. You have to pay taxes to sell dope. Watts ain't nothing nice. You come up missing if you go against, up against Watts. Look at Shorty. Look at Kamane. Chewbacca said he had witnessed confrontations that with Big Shorty had with Watts in front of one of the Wells buildings in the days before his murder. Excuse me. Watts was pressing Big Shorty for money. We don't eat like that anymore, Shorty told Watts. I'm done. I'm going to the feds on your ass. A few days later, he was shot down. Nobody lives to tell when they get into it with Watts, said Chewbacca. Watts leaves no witnesses. On many occasions over the years, Chewbacca said he had seen Watts take drugs off of one person and put them on another. He intimidated, he, in, he emanated, I'm sorry, Watts passing drugs from hand to hand saying, hmm, what's going to ride, the, who's going to ride the train today? Growing up on South State Street, Chewbacca had known Watts before he joined the department. Watts was not, he said, a cop who went bad. He was a dope dealer who got a badge to further his criminal vocation. Y'all still with me? Because I'm one page shy of being halfway through the reading of this. I want to make sure you guys are still hearing me.
Misty. How many of y'all are asleep? I'll give it a minute for all those that are lagging. You're still with me? Okay. As long as somebody's listening. Because I can read it to myself and just record it. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not talking to myself. Because I know it says there's 23 people in the chat, but they could be all asleep, so I don't know. Because I know we've been on a while. All right, let me get back over here then. I run out of drink, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Cause it's a lot of reading. Cause like I said, it's 40 pages, and I'm on page 19 right here. All right, let's see. Angry about being falsely arrested, Chewbacca was prepared to work with Blondie and Danny, including wearing a wiretap to bring Watts down. Another one of their informants, a drug dealer at the Harold Ike's home on South State Street, had traveled a similar path. Like Chewbacca, he had his own reasons for working to bring Watts down. He was really good, said Blondie. We could never get him. He had built a relationship with the man. He said, you're never going to get me. But he helped us get everybody else. Watts came to the Ikes dealer to get paid off, Blondie recounted. There were drugs and guns on the table between them. You've got to give me more than you've got on the table, said Watts. The drug dealer misunderstood him. He thought Watts meant he wanted more drugs and guns when he wanted more money than the value of what was on the table. If he had understood, according to Blondie, he would have gone along. She quoted him as saying, if that motherfucker told me I needed to give him another 5000 I would have given it to him. As a result of this communication glitch, Watts put someone else's package on him and arrested him. He did two years and was particularly upset to have missed the birth of his son. When he came out of prison in the fall of 09, he had a brief he had a beef with Watts and was prepared to work with Blondie and Danny as a CI, a confidential informant. They developed a sting in which both he and Chewbacca played roles. In February, okay, I see y'all's comments. Y'all must be on a delay, but okay, at least you're still here. February 2010, Chewbacca ran into Watts and described his role as a drug carrier. Nobody suspects me, he told Watts. I walk dope and money up and down State Street all the time. Because I'm invisible. The plan, according to Blondie, was, Chewbacca's, was for Chewbacca's outfitted with a pin and baseball cap rigged with audio and visual surveillance devices to go to 22nd Michigan to a parking lot on 26th and State, where he would deliver a bag to their CI from the Ikes, who would be parked in a convert FBI, covert FBI vehicle. Watts isn't going to take the bait, Blondie told the FBI agents. She predicted he would observe Chewbacca's courier routine first. I know him. He's careful and calculating. That's why he's still on the streets. The scenario played out as predicted. Watts and his partner, Mohammed, observed the operation but didn't pounce. Hey, buddy, that was smooth, Watts told Chewbacca later. That was so smooth. Having hooked Watts, they orchestrated a string, a sting in March of 2010 to reel him in. 
An agent gave Chewbacca the bag containing the money. Another agent was to follow Chewbacca to witness the transaction so he wouldn't have to testify in court. Do you have eyes on the CI? Blondie asked over the phone. I'm not going to be Daisy chained to his ass, the agent replied. I'm going to lunch. In the end, the agent did not see the transaction, nor did Smith, who was observing from a nearby hotel room. He explained to Spaulding that he had to go to the bathroom. So what does that tell you? They got people inside the FBI that works with Watts. Easy as that. I ain't stupid. Watts, who was off duty, showed up in his police uniform, driving an official vehicle. Mohammed with him. Chewbacca also observed another member of the team, Al Jones. In the course of the sting, Watts intercepted Chewbacca and took the bag. When he looked inside, he became agitated. It's empty. Oh, here it is, uttered clothes and other, under clothes and other stuff, he found $5,000. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, Watts told Chewbacca. We're going to have to arrest you for your own good. I'll send it to my guys to bail you out. I'll send my guys to bail you out. In all likelihood, Spalding speculated he would have dispatched off-duty members of the team to bail out Chewbacca with some of the money that they had just ripped off of him. Chewbacca was holding a 7-Eleven coffee mug that was wired. While being handcuffed, he managed to hold on to that mug. He protested fiercely that he didn't want to go to jail. He ultimately prevailed. Watts gave Chewbacca 770 and released him. The two officers then drove to Mohammed's house where they presumably divided up the spoils. Blondie and Danny were unnerved. FBI agents had repeatedly expressed suspicions that CPD was subverting to the investigation. Now, in the light of the blotched sting in which one FBI agent broke contact with the CI, and the other one took a bathroom break at a critical moment that they wondered, was the FBI really this inept or was something else going on? After two years after the murder of Khomein Fears, the purveyor of the Obama dope line, Blondie and Danny made a major advance in the investigation. The homicide remained unsolved. I'm getting repositioned here. <laughs> and under the pretext of investigating the case, they reached out to those who had been close to fears by pretending to be interested only in the murder. They hoped to make it easy for those interviewed to freely talk about the operation of the drug trade and thereby gathering intelligence about Watts' criminal enterprise. The str strategy worked. Over time, they developed a relationship with Fear's former girlfriend. That's the CI that we see in Rava's case. That said that the person that killed her boyfriend was born in 1984 and threatened her. Fears had been shot outside of her home on the 3700 block of Calumet. She was a nursing student at Ken Kennedy King College. Spalding described her as well-spoken, no attitude. She had made good choices. Then she met Kermaine Fears. By the time she realized who he was, she was in love and pregnant. The young woman who could not be reached for comment became a major source for, for Blondie and Danny. She gave them valuable information about the drug trade. She told them where the Obama dope line stash houses were and described the internal workings of the operation. She had been with Kamein dozens of times when he paid off Watts, said Spalding. One day, she was walking a few steps behind Fears, and Watts, when Watts patted Fears' pocket, Easter's coming up, he said. Where's the money? My kids need Easter baskets. As the demol demolitions progressed at Ida B. Wells, 
Spears moved his operations to 37th in Indiana. Watts came around seeking to tax him as if he had at the Wells and Ikes. Spears refused now that the high rises were down and threatened to give Watts up to the feds. A few days later, he was killed. Early that morning, Spears and his girlfriend were laying in bed together. He got a phone, a call on his phone. He says, I have to go handle this. He went outside. She heard gunfire. She looked out the window and saw a hooded figure leaving the scene. The man turned and looked up at the window. She was afraid he saw her. Now, now knowing how fears operated, she said no one could get close to him unless they knew him. The shooter or shooters took two cell phones off of his body so it couldn't be determined who had made that call that set him up and retrieved all of the shell casings. Having built their relationship with Fear's girlfriend on the next pretext, they were working the homicide. Blondie and Danny had, in fact, with her help, develop significant new information about the murder. So they took her to the cold case unit in, hope, in the hopes detectives there would persuade the leads, pursue the leads that had been generated. The sergeant they dealt with was not welcoming. Blondie and Danny were not in the room when the sergeant interviewed the girlfriend. After they emerged, the sergeant asked the woman, gesturing towards Blondie and Danny, what did those two guys do that my guys couldn't do in two years? It's very simple, she replied. They did something none of your officers did. They knocked on my door and asked me. That just fucking gave me goosebumps. God damn. During this period, Blondie and Danny also talked with Kamane's mother and brother Jerome, a.k.a. Monk, who had assumed leadership of the Obama drug operation. The relationship they developed was, was such that when the mother died, the family invited them to the wake. One day, as they drove past 37th in Indiana, Monk flagged them down. He leaned in Danny's window. And the three talked about 45 minutes. Moments after they parted, Blondie received a call from the DEA agent she knew. They set up a meeting in a nearby alley. How do you know Monk, the agent asked. We're trying to get him wired up, get a wire on him. We just saw you flag him flag you down and talk with you with a touch of disgust pride, at least in the retelling, she asked. Do you want his phone number? She made a phone call. Hey, Monk, she said. I just wanted to make sure this is your number. Thanks. When Watt's name came up in the course of the conversation, she recalled the DEA agent was outraged to learn he was still on the force and had been promoted to sergeant. Watts is still around, as corrupt as he is, we were looking into him 10 years ago. I can't believe your fucking department. I can't believe they didn't do anything about it. By the summer of 2010, Blondie and Danny had, in effect, been orphaned by both agencies involved in the joint investigation. On the FBI side, that behavior of Special Agent Patrick Smith had become increasingly erratic. It turned out he had never done the paperwork necessarily necessary to properly establish them at the FBI, and they lost access to the office and the car that they had been using. On the CPD side, Tina, the chief of internal affairs who had assigned them to the Operation Brass Tax, had been moved to another command position. They lost their key protector. Fast forward, uh, Blondie said, I believe in Tina, I believe if Tina had stayed, in place, none of this would have happened. She would have protected us. Tina was replaced by Chief Juan Rivera, well liked within the department as one high ranking official put it to me the rank and file. No, he cares about cops. Rivera had a long standing relationship to the Watts investigation. He had been a sergeant in the internal affairs when it was initiated. Now, years later, 
he was once he had, was back as chief and the case was still open was once again his responsibility okay looking back blondie now believes that the investigation was designed to fail watts was known to be at the center of a far-flung criminal enterprise with multiple co-conspirators, yet the investigation was reduced to two cops, one car, one radio, and, and good luck. Nonetheless, the two undercover officers continued to work the case as best they could. Then the bottom fell out. The first sign that something was wrong came in August of 2010 when they submitted paperwork to Commander James O'Grady of the Narcotics Division seeking approval of their Ike's informant as a CI. Word came back from a sergeant they dealt with in narcotics that O'Grady had refused to approve the application and had instructed him, you are not going to work with those IAD rats. And he's calling Blondie and Danny rats now. Realizing that their cover had been blown, Blondie and Danny immediately sought out Rivera. He told them, he had informed Deputy Supervisor Ernie Brown that they were working on the Watts investigation. Brown, said Rivera, must have told everyone. Today, Blondie recalls this, is, this as the instant when everything changed. She immediately gasped the implications. I knew I was doomed. She remembers every detail, the smell of the coffee brewing in the IAD office, the perspiration soaking into her shirt, the sensational of a free fall. What the fuck did you do that for? She challenged Rivera. I thought it would be helpful for you, he said. What do you mean? She shot back, telling someone who's friends with Watts. I think I might have fucked up, Rivera said. My life is in this man's hands, she recalls thinking, and he is telling me he fucked up. They were, she knew, utterly exposed. You guys are in grave danger, Rivera said, and I can't protect you. So from now on, you have to be extremely careful. Fly completely under the radar. Rivera described a meeting of bosses at which O'Grady referred to them as rats. And Nick Roddy, 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 whatever his name is, the chief of the organized crime bureau said he wouldn't allow them to work in any other any unit underneath him although o'grady was their commander he had never met him he wouldn't know us if he saw us on the street blondie said yet he was according to rivera ordering officers under his command to retaliate against them god help them if they ever need help on the street rivera quoted their commander as saying, it ain't coming. O'Grady and Roddy, Roddy denied making the utterances Blondie alleges. Their denials are sweeping and categorical. In statements in which, in the whistleblower case, each made the same sworn declaration. I never made any statement to or about plaintiffs or took any action against or relating to plaintiffs based on any reports they may have made to the FBI of alleged criminal misconduct or corruption by Watts, Mohammed, or any other Chicago police officer. The Chicago Police Department and the FBI both declined to comment. All the law enforcement officers who are named in this article either declined to comment or did not respond to the request for comment. Rivera in his depositions, denied talking with Ernie Brown about the involvement of Spalding and Danny in Operation Brass Tax. He denied ever talking with O'Grady about the two officers. He denied playing any role in outing them. And he denied that the conversation Blondie describes with great emotions as a pivotal traumatic experience. The moment she realized how exposed they were ever took place. 
I guess they're leaving out some words. I don't know. At the time, Rivera acknowledged, acknowledged that he had numerous conversations with Blondie and Danny and that they had talked almost every day. Despite his sensitive position, he was, according to Blondie, an ex expansive talker. It seemed to give him pleasure to instruct her and Danny about things really, how really, how things really worked within the department. Rivera Spalding said, told us stories about everybody. Part three. On February the 22nd in 2011, Rahm Emanuel was elected mayor of Chicago bringing to an end the 22-year reign of Mayor Daley II. I just lost my plate. Okay. The election drew national attention and insisted on speculation that he sought the role of mayor as a stepping stone to the White House, something he repeatedly denied. Being mayor of Chicago, he insisted, was his dream job. No Emmanuel appointed was more closely watched than his choice of new superintendent for the Chicago Police Department. While the integrity of Mayor Daley, Superintendent Jody Wise, was never questioned, he had often seemed politically tone deaf and had proved unavailable to translate his outsider status into effective power within the department. Emmanuel's choice, Gary McCartney, the police director from Newark, New Jersey, was also an outsider, but he was described as a cop's cop. McCartney had earlier served under William Bratton in New York, where he built his reputation managing CompStat, the data-driven managing tool for NYPD had developed for holding commanders accountable for crimes in their district. For high-ranking police officials, transitions in department leadership are times of upheaval. As one put it to me, this is especially true when the new superintendent comes from outside and is, unknowingly, uh, and is unknown quantity. Among the things known about McCartney that might have been expected to stir anxieties, were his strong identification with Comstat and his intention to move swiftly to make good on Emmanuel's campaign pledge to put an additional thousand officers on the street. Operating largely on their own without meaningful support from FBI or CPD Internal Affairs Division, Chicago police officers Blondie and Danny carried on as best they could with their investigation into the far-flung criminal enterprise allegedly run by Watts and his gang tactical team. According to Blondie and Danny, the characters of their jobs, the very air through which they moved, had fundamentally changed after they were outed by the head of eternal affairs, Juan, Chief Juan Rivera. Exposed and isolated, now known as IAD rats, they knew better than anyone what Watts and company were capable of, yet they continued. Two officers, one car, one radio to work the case. Their efforts paid off. One day, as they drove past the apartment where Monk Fears and his girlfriend lived, they noticed his car was smashed up. The girlfriend told them the following story. She and their baby were in the car with Monk, who was in the process of re-upping, distributing packages, and collecting money. So there were lots of dope and there was a lot of dope and cash in the car. Watts and his team came for them. Watts and his partner, Mohammed, were in an unmarked car with the city plates. Brian Bolt, Bolton and Bobby Gonzalez, two other members of the team, were in a CPD Tahoe. A wild car chase ensued on the Dan Ryan Express, Lakeshore Drive, and ultimately into Hyatt Park neighborhood, where Monk lost control of the car and crashed into a, a park, crashed in the park. He fled on foot. Watts and his team seized the dope and cash. They didn't even check on the condition of the woman and infant who remained in the car. 
Monk's girlfriend noticed that a man she recognized who worked the Obama dope line was handcuffed in the back seat of the Tahoe. Blondie and Danny were familiar with this individual. They tracked him down and described how he had banged around in the back seat of the Tahoe because he was handcuffed and could not brace himself. On 35th Street near U.S. Cellular Field, he said, the officers had taken the handcuffs off and released them. You did nothing, they told him. Monk was shaken by the car chase. They're out of control, he told Blondie and Danny. I don't know where it's going to end, referring to the fate of his brother, Kamane Fears. He said he was worried he was in line for the Watts special. The accelerating pace of the public housing demolitions, it appeared, was destabilizing things not only for the gangs, but also for the corrupt police who fed on the drug trade. As the buildings came down, the careful and calculating Watts, as Spalding once described him, and his team was becoming increasingly reckless. Several weeks later, Monk's girlfriend let Blondie and Danny let Blondie and Danny know that he had been locked up. They arranged to talk to him via her cell phone. When Monk called, Blondie and Danny spelled out the offer the feds were prepared to make in exchange for his cooperation in the Watson bus investigation. Monk agreed to proffer and to wear a wire in his dealings with Watts. This was, said Blondie, a huge break in the case. They made plans to pick Monk to pick up Monk at the facility where he was incarcerated at at 8 a.m. on May the 4th and bring him to F the FBI. Monk fears and his girlfriend could not be reached for comment at, for this article. On the afternoon of May the 3rd, which is the day before, Blondie and Danny received a call from Tom Chester, the IAD liaison to the FBI. He told them there had been a meeting at which it was decided to take them off the investigation. They rushed to CPD headquarters to talk with Tina, the former chief of internal affairs. They told her Monk was prepared to proffer, but they were being taken off the investigation. Tina was aghast. This cannot happen, she said. The superintendent is involved in this investigation. Blondie told Tina that there, were, there was about to be a meeting of senior officials, including Rivera and Commander James O'Grady, regarding their fate. Tina went down to the meeting. She apparently was unable to gain access because she soon returned and said, I'll, take, I'll talk with Juan. Later that afternoon, Blondie and Danny received voicemail messages from Deputy Superintendent James Jackson informing them that they were no longer assigned to the FBI and were being reassigned to CPD. He instructed them to report in uniform to the dispatch detached services until unit on May the 4th at the beginning of their shift. Juan Rivera was their principal source for information about what had happened. Here is what they say he told them. A supervisor in the detached service unit had asked Danny what he and Blondie were working on. As instructed by Rivera, he referred to her to Deputy Superintendent Deborah Kirby. Deputy Superintendent Patrice called Kirby to confirm that Blondie and Danny were working on an undercover investigation and the paperwork was in place. Kirby denied knowing who Blondie and Danny were much less knowing that they were involved in any undercover investigation. When I read this the first time, that blew my mind because it's like, okay, so you got somebody working in the FBI office and y'all don't even know? Is that what y'all are claiming? Because in, in all in all, that's basically what they're saying because they had an office inside the FBI building. On the basis of Kirby's denial, Julio Cuchello, I don't even know what this guy's name is, and Jackson concluded that Blondie and Danny were lying when they said that they were engaged in internal investigation. According to Rivera, Kirby admitted to him that she had screwed up by not clarifying the situation. He quoted her as saying, 
I'm supposed to be over this investigation. I'm not going to clear this up now. Too many bosses look bad. How could we not know what's going on for two and a half years? However, implausible, this account, why couldn't Rivera, as chief of internal affairs, definitively resolve the matter? There was no doubt about the outcome. So on May the 4th, Blondie and Danny did not go to pick up Monk to take him to the FBI, but headed to the detached service unit. En route, they were instructed to go instead to the police academy for one day training. They're getting sent all the way back down the ladder. When they arrived, a sergeant addressed them sharply. You're not here for a one-day class, he said to Blondie. He said, you're going to the third district uh, on midnights. And to Danny, you're going to 15 on midnights. And don't act like you don't know what's going on. They were taken aback by his punitive tone. Danny had been talking on his cell phone as he entered into the building. The sergeant reprimanded him for doing so. Danny handed him the phone. Rivera was on the other end of the line. Yes, chief. They overheard him say, sorry, chief. Yes, chief. The sergeant told Rivera, among other things, that he had received an email from Jackson about Blondie and Danny. After the conversation with Rivera, the sergeant handed the phone back to Danny. I apologize, he said. It seems you two really don't know what's going on, and neither does the chief. Blondie later asked Rivera whether he had seen Jackson's email. He said he had, but he didn't share its content. It would just upset you, he said. During their lunch hour, they rushed from the academy to headquarters and told Tina that they were going to be put on the street. What? They can't do that, Tina said. That's going to get you killed. Tina sent a directive to the academy that the two officers were not under any circumstances to be assigned to patrol. They spent the day in a small room in the academy without phones, computers, or radios. They would remain there for most of the next three weeks. At the moment, they were poised to bring the Watts investigation to a successful conclusion, they were, as Blondie put it, placed under house arrest. They were given no meaningful work to do at the academy. It was suggested that they sit in on classes for new recruits. And at one point, they were directed to act as in-car camera instructors, despite having never used an in-car camera. On May 16th of 2011, while they were at the academy, Rahm Emanuel was sworn in as mayor of Chicago and Gary McCarty became police superintendent. Within 10 days, McCarty acted as Emanuel's campaign pledge on Emanuel's campaign pledge and reassigned the first 500 officers of the promised thousand to beats in the district. Blondie and Danny were not among them. Tina had them reassigned to the Inspections Division Unit 126 under her command, where once again they sat idle at empty desk. I have nothing for you to do, Tina said apologetically. Their supervisor, Lieutenant Deborah, was openly hostile towards them. Danny, in his dip deposition, testified that he, she called them rat mouth motherfuckers, or rat motherfuckers. There we go and spread the word within the unit that they should be shunned. I'm a lawyer and know how to put a case together, he quoted her as saying. I'm going to work on getting them fucking launched. In, a despairing, for, in despairing for Blondie and Danny as the abuse was the detail of work. When they weren't sitting at their desk with nothing to do, they were reduced to chauffeuring Pachuca around, often on her personal errands. They started getting written up for this and that. Even in one instance, Blondie said on her day off, they're trying, Rivera told them, to build a false file on you. 
September 13th of 2011, Blondie and Danny met with Commander Adrian Stanley, their commanding officer, and told her of the retaliation and hostile work environment. I don't want to hear this, Stanley said. I don't want to know nothing. She refused their request that she initiate a complaint register, an investigation or a CR. The commanding officer, having re refused to intervene, Pachuca's campaign against them continued and was joined by others, according to Blondie. Increasingly concerned about Blondie and Danny, Tina ordered them to discuss the retaliation with Rivera. But Tina's memory of these events, as reflected in her deposition, is hazy. And in response to the questions, she repeatedly replied that she could not recall. When Blondie and Danny asked Rivera to initiate a CR investigation, he refused. Danny challenged him. Since no one at CPD will do anything, we need to take this to an outside agency, he said, referring to the Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The normality, easygoing, Rivera responded angrily. Look, Dan, right now the entire department is against you and Shannon. I'm the only one on your side. If you file a complaint, you will piss me off. And believe me, that's the last thing you want to do is piss me off. Then you'll have no one helping you. Just leave it alone. Frustrated by Rivera's refusal to initiate a CR investigation, Blondie and Danny sought the advice of Pete, a formal internal affairs officer who had recently retired after 38 years in the department. 17 of them was with IAD. Uh, Pete talked to, with them and repeated, repeatedly and at length in an effort to access their, assess their credibility. The reason being, he said, of his conversations with Blondie in his deposition in her case, I wanted to hear her tell me the story more than once and as many times as I could because as a policeman and an investigator, if someone is lying, they're going to get tripped up. And I found that she was straight on the line or on point every time I talked to her. Having served on the team that managed the 1999 transition in public housing from Chicago Housing Authority Police to the CPD, he had independently not independent knowledge of Watts and his team. It was during this assignment that he first became aware of the criminal, criminal activity by the police working in the public housing. The information gathered by the transition team was turned over to the FBI. Uh, although he was not directly involved, he was aware of the ongoing investigation of Watts and his team, an investigation that Juan Rivera assumed the responsibility for when he joined the confidential section of the IAD back in 2005. Watts and Mohammed were not the only targets of the investigation, he said. In an affidavit in another case, there were multiple members of Watts' tactical team that were also targets. He testified in his deposition that he reached out to Patrice to get her assessment of Blondie and Danny. Yeah, I know them, she replied. And I find them to be good officers. I don't know why everybody is messing with them. She reported that there had been a meeting at which Roddy and O'Grady said that they were IAD rats and that they were not welcome back in the narcotic sector. Having concluded, Blondie was telling the truth. So he agreed to help them. Among other things, he told me, he arranged to meet with the new superintendent. He warned McCarty about several undetained scandals within the department, which included the Watts case, and urged him to get out ahead of them. He also told him of the retaliation against the two officers who had developed a case against Watts. McCarty listened, he said, and thanked him for his information. He confirmed for Spalding and Danny that CPD regulations require a supervisor 
who is informed of the misconduct to initiate a CR investigation and forward it to the Internal Affairs. According to Blondie and Danny, they repeatedly asked Rivera to initiate the CR investigation for various acts of retaliation, yet he refused. They ultimately named him as a defendant in their lawsuit, not for the retaliation against them, but for failing to protect them from the retaliation. Rivera, in his deposition, denied that Blondie and Danny ever formally requested that he initiate a CR investigation. Uh, such a request would normally take the form of a two from memo he testified. And he received no such document from either officer. So in other words, because they did it orally and not written, he didn't have to take any action about it. It says, uh, the sworn statements and depositions of Rivera and the other defendants in which they contest Blondie and Danny's version of the events are available with the online version of this paper, this article. I asked Blondie why, in her view, Rivera had not initiated the investigation they requested. He had, she said, many too, made too many deals thereby neutralizing his ability to act, attributing to her understanding of the dynamics largely to conversations with Rivera himself, conversations that he denies ever occurred. She described him as ensnared in a web of mutual black male in which bosses have leverage over one another by virtue of their shared knowledge of the deals they have made. She gave an example. I make this CR against your guy go away if you'll promote my guy within your unit. The code of silence and the clout are thus intertwined. Rivera, she recalled, once remarked to her that the bosses trade CRs for favors like baseball cards. In October of 2011, Blondie and Danny got a call from Rivera informing them that they were to return to the FBI and a brief and brief a new agent about the Watts case. Shortly afterwards, Danny was driving with Sergeant Al, a liaison between the CPD and the FBI. They were talking about the renewed Watts investigation. None of this was necessary, Danny said. We had Monk. The department couldn't take that risk. He told them, we couldn't risk having Monk go on the stand and talk about Watts killing his brother. Danny was stunned. Five months after their removal from Operation Brass Tax and Bo Heckmer, whatever the guy's name is, just told him what had really happened. He had investigated had the investigation been derailed not because of the cross lines of communication among the bosses, but because of where it was leading. He remarked, his remark was the first in a series of shocks. Blondie and Danny learned from Chewbacca at the three of them drove to the FBI that in their absence, Special Agent Patrick Smith, Blondie and Danny's primal FBI contact had been deploying him on questionable assignments such as buying prescription drugs and Viagra on the street. He also said Smith had him not pay had not paid him for his work. Now this picture off to the left by the way is Chewbacca. If I remember correctly they said when they arrived at the FBI they reported that Chewbacca had what Chewbacca had told them. Agents talked to Chewbacca for several hours. Blondie and Danny were not in the same room. Chewbacca was directed not to talk with them about Smith, and they didn't probe. They didn't want to put him in an awkward position. Several days later, they spoke with Rivera back at CPD headquarters. The conversation took place in a hallway at Eternal Affairs. 
Rivera informed them that the FBI had initiated an investigation in, and Washington was coming to interview them. We're going to have to sit down and figure out what we're going to say, he told them. We have to be on the same page. Blondie replied that she did not see any need for a meeting. I'm going to tell the truth. You can't ever tell the truth, Rivera heatedly said. You're getting us, all of us fired. I just went through a federal trial with all the SOS shit. I can't withstand another trial. Blondie understood this to be a reference to the fact that Rivera, as the head of IAD, had failed to root out the criminal activities of the special operations section. Not only robbing drug dealers, but also ordinary citizens and attempt to, attempted murder for hire. How could he explain leaving Watts on his team on the streets for a decade? The chief of internal affairs is the most powerful person in the Chicago Police Department, Blondie observed. They own the report only to the superintendent, yet because Rivera's failure to exercise that power, it shifted to the corrupt officers. Watts understood this, she said. She heard him on more than one occasion say in the presence of other officers at the station house, you think the feds are going to come against me? If they come after me, I'm going to sing a song so loud it'll crumble the department and bring all the bosses down with me. This was not idle talk, she said. He was sending a message. In the end, they weren't interviewed. Smith resigned because the investigation was still an administrative matter. His resignation effectively ended it. That, at any rate, is what Rivera told them. They, now, they were now back on the case, as Spalding put it, but at a distance. They didn't work out of the FBI and were put on a need-to-know basis. The FBI seemed less concerned with resuscitating the investigation than with damage control. Blondie and Danny were told that because of Smith's shady work or shoddy work, the Bureau couldn't use any of the intelligence they developed over the years that they had worked on the case. The concern, the concern as they understood it was not that all the evidence was tainted as a legal matter, but rather that if it came out that Smith was a rogue agent, every other case he had worked on would be reopened to challenge. The plan was to start over and build a new case. It would be very different sort of case from the one they had spent years developing. The broad investigation of police corruption involving Watts' entire team and implicating various bosses now contracted down to two agents, Watts and Mohammed. On November the 21st of 2011, they conducted a sting. It was a reprise of what earlier of the earlier scenario. Chewbacca tipped off Watts that he would be transporting a drug, the drug's proceeds in his backpack. He told him he was to pick up a bag from a car at McDonald's on 26th and King and walk it to another car on 29th. At the appointed time, an undercover officer drove into the McDonald's parking lot and handed a bag, black bag to Chewbacca. The bag contained $5,200 and a tracking device. The plan, according to Blondie, was that Chewbacca would deposit the bag in the car at 29th and leave the door open. When he arrived at the spot, he couldn't gain access to the car. The FBI had had not unlocked it. As he was trying to get into the car, Mohammed drove up and took the bag from him. Get the fuck out of here, Mohammed said. I don't got no money. I don't get no money, protested Chewbacca. Mohammed told him to meet him later on 30th and King. Chewbacca then called Watts. Come on now, he said. I did everything right, man. Watts revised the plan. 
they would meet at 22nd and Canal. When Watt showed up some 40 minutes later, Chewbacca expressed relief. No, never doubt it, brother, Watt said, who always takes care of you. You do, Watts. There's five large, brother. Watts handed Chewbacca some money and then drove away. A few minutes later, Chewbacca gave the agents $400. They searched him but found no other money on him. Perhaps the habit of skimming went too deep that Watts couldn't help himself from shorting Chewbacca. During this period, Spalding and Danny continued to report to Rivera. They spoke with him frequently. You're absolutely the most dangerous person to the department right now, Rivera told Blondie, because you know too much and you talk too much. But she thought to herself, I'm the only one around here who doesn't talk. The hostility from the bosses, Rivera explained, isn't about Watts. They're worried you're going to tumble, to tumble their house of cards because the bosses don't know what you know, he went on. They're worried that you're going to investigate them. Their situation, as described by Rivera, was Scott. I don't even know what that word is. They had been outed as working undercover as an internal affairs investigation, but no one knew whether that was the only investigation that they were engaged in. So it was all too easy for the bosses to worry that they were they too were targets. It was also becoming apparent that there was particularly ferocity to the abuse directive at Blondie. The ongoing attacks were disguised by their pettiness and ugliness. When she mentioned to Chester, the FBI liaison, that she had purchased tickets to the Narcotics Division Christmas party, she told me, he urged her not to attend. That Roddy and O'Grady both had expressed such hostility towards her. Chester said that I wouldn't be surprised if the chief didn't have you kicked out. It's in your best interest not to go. On another occasion, O'Grady gave instructions that Spalding be barred from entering the organized crime facility at Holman Square, where she was assigned a locker. A supervisor who was present later told her that O'Grady said she could piss outside with the rest of the rats. The abuse followed her home. One day, she reached into her mailbox and found it full of shit. There was a note, since you like shit so much, thought you would enjoy this. On February the 12th of 2012, Mohammed was arrested at home and Watts returning from Houston, was escorted from the terminal by the FBI agents. Both were charged with theft of government funds. The arrest was widely reported by Chicago media. The most substantial story was by Phil Rogers, a veteran correspondent for Channel 5 NBC News. Superintendent McCarty said, at this point, there's no body involved other than those two officers who were arrested. Rogers, however, quoted sources close to the investigation as staying, saying that the allegations against Watts and his team go back more than 10 years. That other officers are under investigations and that troubling allegations have rumbled through the investigative cracks for years. That Watts had a handful hand in two homicides, the unnamed source close to the investigation was Blondie. Why had the FBI and CPD decided to reel in Watts and Mohammed rather than continue the investigation and endangering engage the other targets? Why had they left other members of Watts' crew on the street? Why had they decided to conclude the decade-long investigation into the allegations of the massive wrongdoing reaching high and wide within the department with the arrest of two individuals on a single charge of stealing government property, which was the $4,800? Rivera's answer, according to Spalding, was that the powers that be had determined 
the city can't afford another scandal. Were a Watts scandal to erupt, he said, it would call it would make the SOS look like Boy Scouts. It was, in effect, too big to expose. The rest of, and prosecution of Watts and Mohammed were thus designed to contain the scandal rather than to expose it. Soon after Watts and Mohammed were arrested, Spalding told me she encountered Mike Bars, the commanding officer of the confidential section of internal affairs. In the parking lot of police headquarters on 35th in Michigan. Boy, I can't find no big red. What you talking about? Uh, bu- 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 bu. You uh, says, um, you don't learn, he said to her. You want to tell all. That's not how it works. It's not what you uncover. It's not what you find out. It's what the department says. Your job is to report to them. It's their job to say what happened. Blondie was taken back. Bars continued to birate her. All those promises they made to you, they lied to you. They want you to be a hero, catch a cop killer, shut your mouth. That's how you get along. This shit will get you nowhere. Bars offered her a final piece of advice. You know all that work you claim you did? If you don't have police reports with your name on them, you never worked on it. It didn't happen. You don't exist. But, Blondie said, that was for our protection. Think about it, said Bars. For your protection? Part 4. After, uh, let's see, in the autumn of 2012, the code of silence was very much in the news of Chicago. The trial of the civil suit brought against the city by Carolina, the bartender, struck and kicked by off-duty officer Anthony back in 07, was um, unfolding before a jury in the federal courtroom of Judge Amy. One of Carolina's central claims was that Anthony assaulted her. Secure in the knowledge he would be protected by the code of silence within CPD. In support of her claim, the lawyers presented expert testimony to demonstrate the department's failure to adequately investigate and discipline the police's misconduct. November of 2012, the jury returned a verdict in her favor and awarded her 850,000 in damages and found that a pervasive code of silence within the CBT had allowed Anthony to attack her without fear of punishment. Mayor Rahm Emanuel was in his second year of office. In retrospect, Carolina's verdict afforded him the opportunity to pivot away from Daly's era of abuse and declare a new day for the police accountability in Chicago. Instead, his administration is an unusual move. He sought to erase the precedent represented by the jury's finding that a code of silence existed within the CPD. The city entered into an agreement with Caroline under which it would not appeal the verdict and would pay the award and attorney's fees immediately. And her, she, in turn, joined the city in asking the judge to vacate the Code of Silence judgment. The joint motion created a situation in which the public interest was unrepresented. Two law professors who specialized in police abuse cases uh, intervened on behalf of the public. They argued that if the city was allowed to buy its way out of the judgment, It would have no incentive to make the necessary reforms. The judge ruled against the city, holding that the jury's verdict regarding the code of silence has a social value to the judicial system and public at large. In their effort to have the code of silence verdict set aside, city attorneys argued that CPD had enacted significant reforms since 07 bar incident. They emphasized that the 
department was now led by a new superintendent who would not permit such behavior to go unpunished. Superintendent McCarty re reinforced the point by ensuing a statement in which he asserted the characteris characteristics bluntness. I will never tolerate a code of silence in the department for which I am responsible. Two weeks before McCartney uttered those words, Blondie and Danny had filed a whistleblower suit claiming they had suffered retaliation for reporting the investigation criminal activity within the department. The defendants named in the lawsuit included CPD brass serving directly under McCartney, among them Nick Roddy and the chief of the Organized Crime Bureau, James O'Grady, commander of the Narcotics Division, Juan Rivera, chief of internal affairs. The common understanding of the bar of the code of silence is that it is a peer-to-peer -peer phenomenon. I've got your back and you've got mine within the rank and file. Senior officials are implicated to the extent that they do not take a firm affirmative steps to discourage the operation of the code. The thesis of the Blondie's case, by contrast, is that the high-ranking officials ordered retaliation against officers for violating the code. When Blondie and Danny filed their lawsuits in the fall of 2012, they had immediately, they had an immediate aim. They hoped that whatever the ultimate outcome of the suit, the fact that the pending cases would serve to tear the retaliation against them that had only intensified after the conclusion of the Operation Brass Tax, a joint investigation conducted with the FBI into the drug ring controlled by lifetime Chicago PD officer Ronald Watts. After Watts and his partner Mohammed were indicted, Blondie and Danny oops, had returned to the inspections unit where they continued to be ostracized and denied meaningful work. IUD Chief Juan Rivera again refused to file a retaliation complaint on their behalf. As noted earlier, Rivera, in his deposition, denied that he ever received a formal request. Barred by Chief Roddy, Roddy, whatever, from returning to any unit in the organized crime, they met with Thomas, Chief of Detectives, for whom they had worked with when he was a commander of the first district. With a year or so earlier, he had asked them to come work for him in the fugitive apprehension unit, but they had been unable to do so because Rivera said they were still needed with the Watts investigation. Now fugitives seem like a good fit. Both Rivera and Tina provided letters of recommendation for them. <clears throat> Bernie said he would place them on the U.S. Marshal task force team and that as soon as spots opened up they would be deputized as u.s marshals he assured them that they would not encounter retaliation in this unit march the 20th of 2012 they joined the u.s marshals task force team despite all they had been through said blondie all we wanted to do was get back to doing real police work it wasn't to be we were not there for 15 minutes and we were called IAD rats. From the start at the fugitive units, they were in a catch-22. They were taken off major cases and given low-level assignments like finding unknown turnstile dumpster, dumpers or people who had been drunk in public. They were told to do only their assigned cases. A limited number of relatively tr trivial cases and then were told they were not producing. When they reported to Rivera what was going on, Blondie said he observed that that's what they do. They give you dead-end work that you can't do, then blame you for not doing it. Blondie said Rivera advised them to record, 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 but again refused to 
ensue a complaint registered for retaliation or intervene on their behalf. Amid the hostility in the fugitive unit, there was one seemingly sympathetic presence, Sergeant Thomas Mills, who had been in the confidential section of IAD when Rivera was a lieutenant there. Rivera told Blondie and Danny to have Mills call him. Mills later reported to them that Rivera had told him that they were great officers. Mills reflected back at Blondie the seriousness of her situation. The only thing he said between those bosses and federal prison is you. If I were you, I'd wear my vest at all times, even coming and going to work. By way of illustrating the political realities in internal affairs, Blondie recounted a story Mills had told them. Soon after he came to the, the confidential section, he was given an assignment of investigating a deputy superintendent. The allegation was that the official lived outside the city. Mills worked on the case for months and concluded that the allegations were true. He produced a thick file in support of the conclusion and presented it to his supervisor. The next day, the file came back to him. There was a yellow post-it on with a handwritten message, make it unfounded. Upset, he took the matter up with his supervisor, who replied that he should have known how to handle the investigation because of who it was. In other words, the outcome should have been clear because the accused was a boss with clout. From now on, Mill told the supervisor, just give me the assignment with the post-it note already on it telling me what the outcome is to be before I waste my time. After recounting the story, Blondie observed, it was like Mike Bars said about the bosses. It's your job to report to them. It's their job to say what happened. Our problem is that we took our, we took the investigation seriously. We never saw the post-it. Blondie and Danny accounted, account of the retaliation they endured after joining the Fugitive Apprehension Unit is corroborated by the affidavit and deposition provided in their case by Officer Janet Hanna, now retired. Hanna was the personal administrator, administrator for Commander Joseph and Lieutenant Robert of Fugitives. She stated that before Blondie and Danny joined the Fugitives, that they were, he had warned the administrative staff in the unit that there were IED rats and should not be trusted. He told sergeants under his command, in her words, to instruct their teams and officers to not provide any backup for Blondie or Danny and, not, and to not work with them at all. Further, Hannah stated that Cisneros ordered her to give them only dead-end cases that would not result in arrest. And he personally reviewed their assignments and that he instructed her to destroy any overtime requests. She also testified that they were denied access to the database required to do their jobs. On June 20th of 2012, Blondie and Danny were ordered to meet with their direct supervisor, Sergeant Maurice Barnes, Cisneros, and Salim. Cisneros informed that they were being taken off the task force because they had too few arrests and priority cases. When Blondie and Danny challenged Cisneros about their lack of activity, Spalding recounted to me, Sal Salim demanded to know whether you were working for internal affairs. You brought this baggage on yourself, he said. You want to investigate bosses. You want to put bosses in jail. You should have known this would, have, was, would happen to you. It's a safety issue, said Barnes, addressing himself to Spalding. I don't want to tell you your tell your daughter you're coming home in a box because the team won't help you on the street. Cisneros spelled it out for them. They were being shifted from days to nights and reassigned a nighttime fugitive app apprehension team on the north side. They would never be deputized by the U.S. Marshals, a, get a take home car or overtime pay. They, that will never happen to you 
or never happened for you, he said to Blondie. At the end of the meeting, Blondie asked if we had ever worked on an internal corporation, if we had never worked on the internal corruption investigation with the FBI, would any of this be happening right now? He said no. Again, they asked Rivera to make a CR complaint. Again, he refused. I can't help you anymore, he said. The ship has, is sinking. The bell has rung. It's over. You have to make it work at Fugitive. This is your last stop. There's nowhere else in CPD for you. Blondie and Danny had hoped that they, that by filling their whistleblower law, law, filing their whistleblower lawsuit, that they would gain the protection of the Illinois Whistleblower Act and the abuse would re, relent. If anything, it intensified. The one person within the fugitive they believed to be an ally, Mills, also turned against them. He rode Blondie harder. This is a numbers unit, and you're not producing, he told her. There's no way you can redeem yourself. I could have come in with Jimmy Hoffa, she said, and it would not have made any difference. Mills spoke only about the lawsuit to other officers in front of Danny and Blondie. I don't know why they left you in this unit after you filed. They should have launched you. This isn't good for you, he warned Blondie. God forbid you should have to shoot someone out there. He pointed to Cisnero's office. He's your lieutenant. How do you think that's going to go for you? He's going to screw you. It's dangerous for you to remain here. The bosses are actively working against you. You need to consider your options. She interpreted this as a suggestion. She leave the department for her own safety. I began second guessing everything I did, she said. On one occasion, as she and Danny set out to pursue, in the pursuit of a fugitive who had to be tased three times to subdue, him the last time he had been brought in they were told by mills that the team would be there to back them up when nobody showed up blondie contacted mills he responded with the text be careful my worst fear was now my reality blondie recalled i was an officer without a department when it seemed things could not get any worse they did on April the 11th of 2013, Sergeant Bars and Sergeant Robert Muscolino of Internal Affairs came to the fugitive unit and arrested Blondie. They took her into a bathroom, closed the door, and held her for a half an hour. Bars read her her constitutional rights and informed her that she was the subject of a criminal investigation on the federal eavesdropping charges. He said they had an eyewitness who stated that she recorded conversation with Mills and then played them for others. She would later learn from Janet Hanna that the complaint against her stated that Hanna was the person for whom she played the recording of Mills. In her affidavit, Hanna recounted being pressed by Mussolino to confirm the complaint. I repeated that the complaint was untrue, she stated, that the allegation, alleged conversation never happened, and that at no time did Shannon play for me any recording from her, from her phone. Blondie was distraught. Having filed a, failed to protect her, IAD was now, she realized, turning its investigation machinery against her and actively participating in the retaliation. Barr suggested that she, that the charges would go away if she dropped her lawsuit. Hey, friend. We finished talking about Robert's case a couple hours ago. They wanted me to read this to them. The Code of Silence. In this retaliation, she said, what are you guys doing about Watts. They can't let him go to trial, he said. It's not in the best interest of the department. They'll make him an offer he can't refuse. Yeah, Blondie said, and I'm going to jail on trumped up charges. 
He tried to mollify her. This is all going to disappear, he said. None of this happened. In an interview with Bars, vigorously contested Blondie's account. Specifically, he asserted that there was no arrest and that they never said that CR was going to disappear. After the IAD officers left, Blondie and Danny walked to their car. In his deposition, Danny recalled how agitated she was. It was hard to have a conversation with her immediately because she was not in the right frame of mind to speak. She was very upset. He testified. She was crying. Shit. It made me want to cry. Blondie had never understood why it was that Chewbacca and countless others pled guilty and cut deals when falsely arrested by the likes of Watts. Now she grasped what it was like to be caught in the machinery of a system indifferent to your welfare and to the truth that was dictated to imposing its own version of reality. The collapse of her faith in the institution which she had pledged her life was now complete. Looking back, Blondie sees this as a moment, the moment she broke. When you work undercover, she told me, at the time, you learn to keep it together even when someone has a gun to your head. I'm keeping it together on the outside, but I'm dying inside. The next day, she initiated the process of going on medical leave, as did Danny. In May of 2013, both went on medical leave. After seven months, Danny returned to the fugitive unit. Blondie remained on leave. She had been diagnosed with, by a psychiatric for the city, as well as her own therapist, as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder due to trauma of having her identity exposed within the department. This condition prevents her from working in law enforcement. On June 6 of 2014, Blondie turned in her badge and gun. It was, she said at the time, the saddest day of my life. Two years later, she speaks with raw emotion of being denied her calling, while some of those they investigated are still on the force. I can't be on the job, but they are. I'm grieving a loss like a death. When they took my badge, they took my soul. Blondie's story, as it unfolds, gathers force and gain credibility through its complexity, coherence, and detail, as well as its knowledge of what the telling has cost her. It's a challenging narrative because the consequences of believing it are also demanding. It is also incomplete. Things she knows with absolute certainty shade into things that can only speculate about. She can only speculate about. Understandably, she inhibits an existential space where it's tempting to organize all available data around thesis and plot to make things coherent more tightly than the messy reality allows. In my interviews with her, she has consistently resisted that temptation. She remains aware of contingencies, what ifs, competing explanations. She continues to work the puzzle that is enmeshed in. It's not hard to see why she is a good investigator. While there is much we do not know yet about the dynamics that determine the course of the Watts investigation, the fate of the investigators, what is clear are the uncertain outcomes, are the certain outcomes, I'm sorry. Mohammed, Watts' partner, pled guilty in August of 2012 and was sentenced to 18 months. He admitted in his plea agreement that he extorted protection money from drug dealers at the Ida B. Wells Developing beginning no later than December the 11th of 2017 and continuing through at least May 22nd of 2008, six months out of his long career working with Watts. Because remember, this went over a decade. He said he acted under the orders of Watts. In the spring of 2014, Mohammed emerged from prison having served his sentence. Ronald Watts initially pled not guilty 
Then on July 19th of 2013, on the eve of the trial, he changed his plea to guilty to one count of theft of government funds. Nothing is known about the substance of the negotiation of the prosecution, if any, and there is no indication in the public record that he provided any information about members of his team other, and others within the department who participated in his crimes. On October the 9th of 2013, Watts came before the Judge Sharon Johnson Coleman for sentencing. The courtroom gallery was sparsely populated. A few reporters, a couple of family members, broad-shouldered and stocky, the expressionless Watts sat in the defendant's table in a dark business suit with his fingers tightly laced in front of him. Judge Coleman was severely constrained in what she could do with the framework presented to her. Although the maximum possibility sentence was 10 years and a quarter million dollars in fines, a sentence of 10 to 16 months was indicated under the federal guidelines. The government asked for 36 months. <laughs> the defense asked for a sentence in line with the federal guidelines. Watts' attorney, Thomas Gladsgrove, emphasized his client's military service, his life, long career of public service, his role in his family, and the fact that he has no criminal record. In a remark passage in the sentencing memorandum he submitted at, to the courts, Glasgow argued that Watts's crime should, for the purpose of sentencing, be treated as less than grave, less grave than picking pocket of a Non foreseeable purse snatching because it was not a theft from another person against a, that person's will and did not involve increased risk of physical injury due to the fact that the taking was both discussed and agreed upon by Watts and Chewbacca prior to the, it occurring. By contrast, the government attorney used strong language to describe the harms that flowed from Watts' criminal enterprise. Citing Mohammed's plea statement, she said that Watts had committed crimes such as the ones he was charged with many times. Judge Coleman gave Watts an opportunity to address the court, but he declined. Coleman characterized Watts' crimes as unconscionable and a betrayal. She seized on the government's description of the Wells development as a community play with crime, drug dealing, and gang activity. The place was rampant with poverty, unemployment, and addictions. The crime stuff snuff the crime stuff comes after. You were there to protect those people and you didn't. When she spoke of the impact corrupt officers such as Watts had on children and in the community, they, they're taught not to respect anything. What else are they supposed to think? After a long pause, Coleman announced a sentence of 22 months, followed by a year mandatory supervision and the restitution of $5,200, the amount Watts had taken in the sting. Watts left the courtroom smiling broadly. He has since served his sentence and relocated to Las Vegas. Apart from the 5200 from the fatal sting, he retained all the assets that he had obtained through his criminal activities. The other members of Watts' team, Al Jones, Brian Bolton, Bobby Gonzalez, remain on the force. Not long after the arrest of Watts and Mohammed, Jones was actually promoted to, to sergeant. Blondie says, they promote you for your silence. Gonzalez has been in the news recently due to his involvement in three separate police shootings of young black men over the last two years. None of the officers responded to the request for comment. As the whistleblower lawsuit moved forwards in court, various, various of the bosses named in the defendants or alleged to have conspired with Watts, retired from CPD. It claimed their six-figure pension and in most instances moved on to other positions in law enforcement. J. 
James O'Grady and Nick Roddy took leadership positions in Illinois State Police. Ernie Brown became police chief of Darren, Illinois, and is now executive director of the Cook County Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Deborah Kerr, Kirby took a job with Garda, whatever that name is. Um, the Irish police now works for a Chicago-based risk management firm. And Juan Rivera took his leave in the fall of 2015 as the whistleblower suit moved into trial. By virtue, Kylie, I could not imagine having that without the fence up there. Lord have mercy. By virtue, Chicago's demolition of the public housing development the scene of the crimes committed by Watts and his team has disappeared. Disappeared. So too have the most of their victims as characterized by Judge Coleman at Watts' sentencing hearing. The vulnerable ho public housing residents, the team exploded, exploited rather than protecting, including children in their community who grew up seeing them as the face of civil authority, invisible people, as Spalding puts it whose lack of standing as citizens in a major factor conferring impunity of predatory officers such as Watts. At various points in this story, individuals has emerged from the invisible world. A world abandoned them, obliterated now, intended, intent on bringing down the criminal enterprise of Watts and company. Above all, Chewbacca also Balding and Danny, informant from the Eichel's, Ike's homes and perhaps two Big Shorty and Monk fears. More recently, a man named Ben Baker, against long odds, established to satisfy satisfaction of the judge who had tried him and the state's attorney's office that had prosecuted him that had been wrongfully convicted, having been falsely arrested by a member of Watts' team. January of 2014, or January 14th of 2016, because this article is written in 2016, having served 10 years of a 14-year sentence, Baker was released from prison after the state's attorney dropped all charges against him for possession of controlled substance. At his trial in 06, Baker had testified that Watts' team planted drugs on him. and falsely arrested him because he had refused to pay them off. At that time, at the time, the judge did not find credible, ba find credible Baker's description of the protection racket of Watts' team operated in the Ida B. Wells development. With help and guidance from Spalding and attorney Jeff, Josh, I'm sorry, of the Exoneration Project, successfully challenged Baker's conviction on the grounds that Baker's allegations against Watts' team was corroborated by investigative materials available at the time of his trial, but withheld from his attorney. The attorney supported this claim with the FBI documents obtained via the Freedom of Information Act. That's a FOIA. Although heavily redacted, the documents established that the FBI, IAD, and state's attorney's office were engaging in an ongoing investigation of Watts and his team for more than a decade. Beyond achieving a measure of justice for Baker, the case is important for what it portends. The attorney and his colleagues have brought a lawsuit against the FBI challenging the redactions under the Freedom of Information Act. They have also brought a civil suit on behalf of Ben Baker. And they are representing a man named Lionel White, who is seeking to have his conviction vacated on the grounds that he was framed by Watts' team. Given the evidence that the team routinely used the threat of false arrest to coerce cooperation, how many others had shared Ben Baker's fate of being wrongfully convicted? Nine years after contacting the FBI, six years after being outed within the department, and four and a half years after filing their lawsuit, Blondie and Danny finally approached their day in court. The trial was set to begin on May the 31st. As the day approached, 
Blondie, with a singular combination of strength and fragility, financially ruined, emotionally depleted, and grief struck stricken over the loss of her job that gave her life purpose and used every part of her. She prepared to tell her story in court in the face of the mutual, mutually reinforcing denials of the city and the individual defendants. Moments before the trial was to begin, the judge announced from the bench that the parties had reached a settlement. Addressing the press in the lobby of the federal courthouse, Spalding expressed the hope that the impact of the case would be that no other officer has to walk one day in our shoes. The settlement means the issues presented by the case will not be adjudicated. It does not resolve those issues. If anything, it sharpens them. At the time, the Department of Justice is investigating CPD, a time when debate about how best to achieve fundamental police reform dominates Chicago politics. The question bequeaths by the case demands sustained attention. On one set of questions relates to the criminal careers of Watts and his alleged co-conspirators. For the better part of those careers, they were under investigation by Internal Affairs and the FBI, and, uh, and well as others, law enforcement agency, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the state's attorney's office. How is it that, <coughs> excuse me, there is no show for those multi-targeted investigations over more than a decade are the convictions of Watts and Muhammad on a single count of stealing government funds of $5,200. Was this, for instance, an investigation as cover-up? Was the prosecution the capstone of a massive cover-up designed not to secure information about Watts' crimes and co-conspirators, but to buy his silence? The DOJ team has the means to answer these questions. It can also assess how it is that members that Watts' team, Al Jones, Brian Bolton, Bobby Gonzalez, and others, remain on the force. Did the investigation, in fact, clear them? More generally, what can be learned from the history of the Watts investigation for the purpose of diagnosing the change required in the operation of internal affairs? Another set of questions centers in the nature of the code of silence. The city has now irreversibly passed over a threshold. The code of silence about the code of silence has been broken. No longer can police officials on the witness stand or in depositions dismiss the term as TV and movie related or in favor formatization oft repeated over the years as the title of a Chuck Norris movie. Mayor Emanuel, in his speech to the city council last December, spoke of the code as a problem at the very heart of policing professional professions. Then several months later, a police accountability task force he had appointed described a deeply entrenched code of silence support not only just by individual officers, but by the very invest institute itself. Elsewhere in the report, the task force recalls the code of official policy. Yet the city, in Blondie and Danny's case, sought to retreat from the implications of those conclusions. As the trial approached, city lawyers, in an effort to avoid having the mayor testify, offered to admit to the existence of the code of silence, but then qualified the statement by adding that the police cover ups are not persuasive, pervasive, widespread settlement, widespread, well-settled custom or practice to which the city's policy, chief policymakers have been indifferent. Similarly, Corporation Counsel Steve Patton, in announcing the $2 million settlement, acknowledged the code of silence even as he minimized it. It's a problem that must be addressed, he said even if only a few officers engage in such behavior. Putting aside the logical puzzle of how the code of silence can be said to exist if practiced only by a few, the city's 
formulation raises a questionable existence to the diagnosis clarity on which meaningful reform hinges. It's the cold of silence, occasional aberrant behavior or standard operating procedure. In Bl if Blondie's account is accurate, then the defendants, including some of the most senior officials in the department, lied under oath and did so in concert. Again, their deniability, the denials are uh, available here. If she's telling the truth, then the city of Chicago in this post Laquan McDonald era of police reform was prepared to present a defense against claims of retaliation due to the code of silence that was itself a classic exercise in the code of silence. For her part, Blondie has no doubt about the answer. The code of silence is only silence to the outside world, she told me recently. For cops, it's a constant ringing in your ears from the day you enter the academy until the day you retire. She paused, reflecting perhaps on the fidelity to the truth has cost her and what it brought her. But I'm deaf to it now. 